Sif Pop Podcast is recorded in front of a live internet audience. Live from a bunker in the heart of the Ozarks, three people living deep and sucking the marrow out of life, now standing on their desks and declaring, oh, Sif Pop, my Sif Pop. Bravo on the Thank intro, you. I got some applause Mr. On that Dicer. One. These poems are good. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Sif Pop. We're streaming live on Mixler every Friday or available to download later in your podcast feed. Unless, of course, you're a patron. Patrons get perks. Patrons get those perks. Oh. We're here today early. Uh, I'm Aaron Dicer from YourMovieFriend.com, and I'm joined by Andrew Ormsby from the Flick Freaks YouTube channel. And every week we'll be joined by a pop culture guru to chat about movies and television and whatever else is on our pop culture minds. And today's guru... It's Danae Hughes. It's me. She's back. I'm You've been on a break. Today. It's good to be back. It's good to be back. And it's good to have you back. Uh, Missed you. I, I, can, can I, I just feel, keep... though, like, Andrew, this should be your seat and I should be in that seat. No, that's that what is, I feel like. This is like whenever you're on, I get thrown back over here because it's like, it feels weird sitting in, in your seat over there whenever you weren't here. I'm like, I'm j- I'm just keeping this warm for Danae so when she gets back. <laughs> Thank you for keeping the seat warm for me. No um, problem. It's it's like when you were young and you'd go on road trips, and if one of your parents weren't there, you'd take the front seat. But if mm. both your parents were there, like they got the front seats, right? Like you'd feel weird with you know like shoving your mom to the back of the van kind of thing. I never yeah. felt weird about that. <laughs> Maybe that was just me. I always wanted to be in the front seat. That was awesome. Our car, whenever we went on road trips, it had the back seats faced the opposite direction, <gasps> so you had to stare at the cars that were right behind you for the entire trip. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I think I was in a car like that just once. It was in the very back kind of hatch mm-hmm. area, and they had two, what are they called, bucket seats or something? Could be. They're in the back. Yeah. Could be. They pop up. Yeah. I thought that was really fun. You just try and not make eye contact with the car that's behind yours. <laughs> uh, not looking at you. Here's how I know Danae is back. There's half-eaten food on the counter. Danae only eats half of everything. In fact, I have to tell you this story. In fact, it was just here till a little bit ago. I cleaned it up. You just moved it. A half-eaten, are you ready for this? Yeah. Jelly bean. Wow. A half-eaten jelly bean. Like, not only does she eat jelly beans in bites, <laughs> which, by the way, incredible. Were she you trying left to find half out what was in the middle? Later. No. No, she was just full. She ate half of a jelly bean. <laughs> what are you, Cindy Crawford? <laughs> it's just, I just wanted a little bit of a flavor, and then whenever I'm done, That's I'm done. That's called one jelly bean. <laughs> most, maybe two you is were, a little bit of flavor. You were flipping out about this yesterday. It's because it's pretty amazing. Because it is the definition of how you eat. For you, it's just as crazy as somebody who eats like several plates of something. Right. Yeah. It's just There's as crazy extremes. as like overeating in an extreme way is the way that you. And it's not like you underfeed yourself. You don't starve yourself. It's just interesting I the snack. way you eat when you eat. I, I, I stop when I'm not hungry, even if it means that I'm <laughs> half moving. Half a jelly bean. <laughs> there, are, jelly bean. there are starving Ethiopians. I would love the they other half of that jelly bean. half of that, that Mike and Ike. Well, Actually, technically, that was just the Ike. You ate the Mike. You yeah. left the Ike. <laughs> that's true. You <laughs> ate Mike. <laughs> yeah, that's how you could tell I'm back. It was half-eaten food. Oh, my goodness. Everywhere. Well, we've got a fun show uh, that we've got in store for today. We're going to chat about Dead Poets Society in a Danae Finally Sees, uh, where Danae sees a classic movie, and we chat about it. Uh, finally. Finally and then, see uh, a movie that Danae's, everyone else has seen. Danae's going to take the rest of the episode from there as well and talk about other things in pop culture that she's seen recently, and we'll... We'll chat more about that when the time Let's comes. Let's just clarify. Mm-hmm. It's because the things that I'm bringing to the table are interesting. I, no, yeah, sure. And they're related to pop culture. Of this course. is stuff that everybody's like, have you seen it yet? Have you finished it yet? And then finally I get to say, yes, yeah. I did. Yes, finally yes, I, I have. And I think that's more normal than us like pop culture like geeks who like digest everything right away. Most people kind of take their time, I think. I, <laughs> I approach my media like I approach my jelly beans. <laughs> That's just halfway. True. Just I, I take what I want. I leave it for later. I'm not feeling bad about oh, leaving my, some of it on the table. Oh, my goodness. I am curious so what true. happened to the other half of that jelly bean. I ate it. Did hey, you eat it today? So yeah. There you go. There you go. See, that's how it works with Danae. That's absolutely incredible. <laughs> she was letting uh, it ferment. And we'll, of course, yeah. have our uh, buried treasure at the end. We like to start off with Do We Care? But today... We're going to start off with We Absolutely Care, and the reason is we want to talk a little bit about Gene Wilder, uh, who passed away recently this week. Just kind of honor him and his legacy and some of the movies he did, and really, he was before our time. 
uh, the movies that I know him best from were before I was born. Oh, yeah. And I'm the oldest one in the room. So uh, it's interesting to kind of go back and look at that career. And He was born in 1933. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. And mm-hmm. dealt with, I guess, Alzheimer's for a long time, but kept it private. Didn't want people to... You know, suffer with him through it. He really seemed interesting like, story. He seemed just like a very private person in general. I think. Do you know he didn't do many interviews or anything? Yeah, mm-hmm. he was one of those people, and I, boy, do I identify with this. Who loves to be in front of a large group? Who loves to perform, but doesn't necessarily want to be involved in you know one-on-one contact with a lot of people. Yeah. Um, you know, there's an introversion to it that I can really identify with. Did you know his real name is Jerome Silberman? I had read that, but I did not know that until I read it. I just found that out. Something you find out after someone goes on to the next thing and you go to their Wikipedia page to pay homage. It's mm. it's kind of a, a um, you know, there's pros and cons to that, right? Like, it's nice that we talk about people once they're gone and honor them, I think. But at the same time, you kind of wish they'd have been around to hear it, you know? Yeah. Every yeah. time someone dies, I feel that way. I feel like, oh. I just wish they could have been around to hear how much people love them. It's almost like we're more free to pour the love on when they're gone. And I and I don't know why that is, but it just it feels that way. So, but let's just start with some movie memories. Like, what are your Gene Wilder movie moments, Danae? Willy Wonka. Yeah, I know it's like on the nose, but I watched that movie growing up, and it came out obviously before I was born. Nineteen seventy one, I think I read seventy one. But it's one of those that I watched over and over and over again. I don't know why I loved it so much. I think because you know, just watching a really quirky adult when you're a kid is super entertaining. Yeah. You know, one that's childlike and makes no sense. And Well, as you grow up, you realize how dark that movie is, though, yeah. too. <laughs> oh, I knew as a kid. Like, yeah. Whenever the tunnel? G- whenever they go in the tunnel, well, the tunnel it was scared terrifying. Us all. Yeah, this, this tunnel was what? scarifying to everybody. Pause? What was that? I don't what know. What was that about? It was that's, the 70s. It's probably from the book. Isn't it from the book? I, don't I never remember read it. reading. I don't remember reading the, that part. Man, that song and the way he delivers it. I know. I was going to mention that as one of my favorite moments that he's had in movies is that tunnel scene. Uh, the way he delivers that poem is so perfect for the combination of imagination and wonder with darkness. They're combined in that moment in a way I don't see them really being combined in in a lot of ways. So I I, I really liked that. I read something um, which, of course, you don't. I don't really know what's true and what's not true. But what I had read after he passed away was that. He um, accepted the role if he could improv his introduction scene, like when he walks out. Oh yeah, yeah. And yeah. his cane gets stuck, and then he falls forward. Mm-hmm. He want he didn't tell anybody what his plan was. He wanted to just, and it was something where reaction. he wanted to make sure that, that that moment could captivate an authentic kind of creation. And, and so I thought that was really interesting that he was willing to sort of step out and say, "This is what I want to have happen if I take this role." But, I mean, I saw him in um, other things here and there, you know, Frankenstein and things like this. But really the role that just always stood out to me was that one. Um, and then my second one, I think, was when he played a... No, I think it was a different one. A toy or something. I can't remember. Anyway. He played a toy. I can't remember. I'm going to try to look it up. What about you, Andrew? So mine is Young Frankenstein. Yeah. Is it? That is my movie from even my childhood. So which, great. Watching uh, it so now... Funny. There was a lot of adult themes as a kid I didn't get. You don't get. Yeah, for yeah. sure. But watching it again, because, you know, I love that movie. It's one of my favorites of all time. But, man, what a captivating movie. Whenever uh, Gene Wilder and Mel Brooks got together for their uh, for, or for their movies, it was just gold. And a lot of people don't know this about Young Frankenstein. Here's a little bit of trivia. They almost uh, quit being friends during the making of that movie. Mel Brooks? Mel Brooks and Gene Wilder. Really? Because Gene Wilder fought tooth and nail to have the putting on the Ritz scene. Uh Uh-huh, yeah, yeah. And Gene Wilder hated it. He Uh, did not want... Mel Brooks hated it? Mel Brooks hated it. He did not want that scene in the movie. Huh. And now it's one of the most iconic scenes in film history. That's amazing. Chat Chat has uh, informed us that the tunnel is in the book, uh, but the poem is not. So, actually, one of my favorite quotes of all time is actually Gene Wilder's, and it's from Willy Wonka. Uh, after, uh, what's her name? Uh, she says, there's no such thing as a schnozberry. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And he says, uh, we are the music makers, we are the dreamer of dreams. One of my favorite lines yeah. from movies. I, his whole performance in that movie is astonishing. It's mm-hmm. captivating. Even yeah. just the way he, so he has the, the funny line where he's like, strike that, reverse it. 
Yeah. One of my favorite things. I use that in my own life occasionally yeah, when I mess words up, like, you know, strike that, reverse it. <laughs> Even the way he delivers something like that, there's almost a gravitas to it. Like, there's a depth of emotion to, like, everything he's doing in that movie that I was not expecting. He just had a presence about him in that movie, Willy Wonka, where yeah. you just captivated you and you could not look away. You mentioned Young Frankenstein. I'll mention Blazing Saddles. Same year. Uh, it came out both the same year. Uh, both Mel Brooks, right? Yeah. And another movie that is very, has very adult themes in it at points that you don't notice. And... Oh, no. <laughs> I, I knew as a kid. I'm like, should I be watching this? This movie is... <laughs> I didn't really? watch it as a kid. So, oh, really? Okay. Yeah. But, uh, but some classic humor in that. I thought that was worth mentioning. The other thing I think is worth mentioning in his career, because you guys took my favorite movies as well, and I think they're kind of the common favorites for him. I think there's one more that stands out. But... Well, I, I wanted to mention Richard Pryor, because that was the other thing about oh, okay. his career that stood out to me was his partnership with Pryor mm -hmm. was a real thing and it just seemed very culturally progressive for the moment too for a white man and a black man to work you know that closely Especially together at the time. in in comedy yeah that's what i mean in time i mean and of course we were there as a nation we were getting well we're still not there as a nation i mean if we're honest but i'm just saying we were getting there to an understanding of what racism had done to us and and what the cultural ramifications were but to you know, see them just palling around and having a good time and, and to, you know, see their roles in those movies, I think was you know, definitely important. Yeah. I'd like to mention one more movie that he did. And sure. it is another Mel Brooks movie, one of his first, which he did before Willy Wonka, which for the producers. Yeah. I think we have to mention the producers, which came out in 67-ish, I think. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, the movie's been remade, I don't know how many times. And Wasn't it was Will on Ferrell Broadway. in a version recently? He was the one with uh, Matt, uh, Matthew Broderick yeah, 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 and yeah. Uh, what's his name? I'm, I'm blanking. I'm sorry, but yeah, the one that they took to Broadway, he was in the film version of that. He was the uh, the Nazi, mm. and uh, man, Gene Wilder. I, I, I that was the first was I think the producers was the first time I saw Gene Wilder, uh, actually, because I know I saw that before Young Frankenstein. Cool, and I didn't see Willy Wonka until I was older for some reason. Yeah. But, um, if there was one more thing I would want to mention before we move on, um, it was that there was a really interesting things too about his love life. A lot of people remember that he was, um, had a really nice, you know, love with, was it Gilda Radner? I think. Mm -hmm. Gilda Radner. Yeah, yeah. She passed away in mm -hmm. 89, I think. And he was very publicly just distraught over that, um, yeah. cause they really loved each other a lot, but he did remarry and there was a post that had a picture of him with his wife and said, you know, People are posting, you know, now you can be reunited with Gilda, yeah. but let's not forget that he has a wife and she's been taking great care of him and to, to you know, to our hearts, oh, that's you know, kind of go yeah. out to them. Um, but they lived in Stamford, Connecticut, and he was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, I think, three years ago, and he kept the knowledge of his condition private because he didn't want to upset any of his younger fans. Uh, quote saying, according to his family, he died while peacefully holding hands with his wife and listening to his favorite music. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. So rest in peace, Mr. Wilder. So my mom, she said uh, that, yeah, whenever you said the Gilda Radner thing, that was the first thing she said is, well, at least he gets to be with uh, Gilda Radner now. Yeah. So um, this is, remember I said I was going to tell a kind of funny story, but not because it relates to Gene Wilder. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, tell us the story. So I was telling my mom that Gene Wilder passed away and she was really distraught. And uh, then we stopped talking about it for, uh, I'd say about 10, 15 minutes. And then she comes back into the room and she says, uh, dad said that he has Alzheimer's. And I'm like, wait, what? And I didn't, I thought she was talking about my dad had <sighs> Alzheimer's, but she oh, was talking no. about how Gene Wilder oh, had no, Alzheimer's. Oh Andrew. And it, <sighs> like wrecked me hard and she's like i don't get what the problem is you you just told me dad has alzheimer's <laughs> oh like, no and she's like no G dad told me gene wilder had and i was like oh my god oh it was the worst oh because i'm like why are you not freaking out oh. <laughs> those moments in life where you hear the wrong you know the uh, wrong information about the wrong person my heart or, just yeah. stopped for you <laughs> oh that you had to feel that for me it was how long an emotional for about coaster. five minutes oh, oh my gosh that's forever. It was forever because I was looking up like, okay, what are we going to have to do? What are we going to do? Are we going to have oh, to do? A lot of Andrew. coconut oil. Yeah. Oh, Andrew. 
I am so sorry, dude. Yeah. That's, I mean, I'm, I'm glad. That- Looking back at it now, I can say that I can laugh at it. Sure. sure. That yeah. five minutes was <laughs> the longest five minutes of my life. You know, there's an interesting thing that happened there, though, Andrew, that you get to experience that not a lot of us do is how you would handle that moment in those emotions. You have a deeper understanding of what that means to you than most of us do. Because you really had to wrestle with it. Turns out not well. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I think that's common. I mean, I'm sure that would be most of us. But I don't really enjoy emotional roller coasters. So I can't imagine that that was a good experience. But it makes complete and perfect sense why earlier, before we started the show, you said, I have a funny story about Gene Wilder. And also, also, it's not it's funny. Not funny, yeah. but it's funny. <laughs> now I can understand exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, totally oh my with gosh. you. Take out the papers and the trash. Are you don't get no spending cash if you don't scrub that kitchen floor. You ain't gonna rock and roll no more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't go back. Just finish. So how about some Dead Poet Society talk? Nothing Nobody's like talking about ever a movie. said that sentence so positively. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because I finally do see movies and people get really excited about it because we can like actually... Yeah. Now I know what people are talking about when they say, oh, Captain, my Captain. Because when, right. when yeah. Robin Williams passed away, that was one of the things that kind of kept popping up. I had oh, no Captain, idea what they were <laughs> talking about. It's a very interesting thing about seeing a movie that is in the cultural consciousness long after the fact that we have loved about the Diné finally sees is you, I remember with Monty Python, all the quotes that you were finally seeing in yeah. context and what they mean and to be able to do that. Me. But we're going to take a look <laughs> at uh, Dead Poet Society and talk about it as a Danae finally sees. And of course, Danae, your input is going to be crucial to this because we kind of are curious to a newcomer to this film so many years later, you know, does it hold up? How did you feel about it? Did you like it? So I think we should just let you start and, you know, tell us how you felt about your experience. You watched it last night. I watched it last night on Amazon, which let me just start off by saying I did not realize that when you watch and stream a movie from Amazon, you have you have a feature that you can click on and it tells you random trivia. Mm-hmm. Ooh, like pop up video. But yeah, yeah. but. It, it goes in time, yeah, with the movie. So, you know, at a certain point in the movie, another thing will kind of pop up and you can read about, you know, here's something interesting that you might not know. Uh, so there's an information about the director and the actors and different scenes and bloopers. Is and... that how you knew that Liam Neeson was originally? No. Oh, okay. No, I looked that up later. We did a fun trivia in the pre-show. We'll post um, that for our Patreon supporters as well. So if you support on Patreon, you can... Check out that outtake. But yeah. go ahead, continue. I learned that later that Liam Neeson was being considered for Robin Williams' role. Well, actually, he had it before the directors shifted. Did you but... feel, did you like that? Did you like that feature? I did. And I wanted to mention it before kind of getting into it because I, I, I did find myself drifting away on this movie. Mm. You know, it just didn't capture my attention maybe as much as it would have if I would have watched it when it came out, <laughs> you know, because filmmaking has changed a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, I would definitely say the pacing is slower, but I think this movie is set in the 50s, so Somewhere around it, it there, yeah. matches the pace of life at that point in time. Um, and Or so we've heard. Not that any of us were I, around to I feel the pace around. of life in the 50s. I didn't, I didn't know. <laughs> um, it was fun because I was recognizing people's faces, you know, that... Uh, like Robert Sean Leonard? Yeah, Dr. Wilson from House. Yes, <laughs> Dr. Wilson. I was like, hey, I know that guy. <laughs> Ethan Hawke. <laughs> Uh, you know, I had no idea who that was. Really? Really? Really. Huh. Interesting. I still don't know. I mean, I know his name, but I don't know what he's been in. Were there any others that you recognized? Any other faces? Um, Red. Kurtwood Smith. Yeah. Red from that 70s who show. Who pretty much is playing the same character. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In this one. That's true. You know, they... uh, with a little more of a serious yeah. turn to it, but yeah. Yeah. So that was interesting and kind of, of course, uh, Robin, of course, I recognized him. Yeah. Um, You know, I just... It was weird because by the end of the movie, I was having a lot. I was far more into it than the beginning of the movie because this is really like a coming of age story for young men. It is. In the 50s. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So I don't relate to any of that. (laughs) (laughs) But I can relate to the theme of, you know, a teacher or a mentor coming into your life and inspiring you to be awake and alive in your moment and find your passion and. I mean, that's something that I think everyone can kind of get behind. But then the stories of all these individuals and kind of their story arc, um, it wasn't it wasn't that powerful for me. Um, 
of course the end of the movie is really powerful mm-hmm. and mm. I, I know we're not gonna be worried about spoilers since this movie was- no 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 i don't think we have to worry about spoilers if you haven't seen dead poet society and you are worried about it being spoiled for you fair warning uh we're gonna be talking spoilers so one of the yeah. main characters ends up committing suicide mm-hmm. and of course i'm thinking about robin yeah so that was a really it's a different kind of resonance past his death. Think you know? about mm-hmm. that. Think about watching this movie with Robin Williams having died mm-hmm. by taking his own life. Yeah. And the entire movie is about, you know, like seizing your moment. And it, they even talk about poetry, you know, being the reason to find your passion for living. Like, mm. you know, you use literature so that you can. Um, it's not just about, you know, waking up in the morning and going to do your job. It's like finding your passion and your purpose and uh, poetry was what propels you to do that. Yeah. And I'm just sitting there wishing that Robin would have been able to pull that from this movie for himself because mm-hmm. I still hate that that was the best option for him in mm-hmm. his mind, you know? Yeah. Um, but mental disease or whatever depression that mm-hmm. he had been going through, that's just something that is just a really hard thing to go through. You mm-hmm. can, unless you're there, you don't, you know, you don't really know. Yeah. So it was a very interesting movie. The ending of the movie was very interesting. For There's me. something there too, about watching it in hindsight, you know, knowing what it, Robin Williams death and that kind of thing about, I just think about the end scene and how beautiful that is. And, you know, again, you think about wishing people would speak into his life like Which that. End or, scene? I, I mean the standing on the desk. So captain, oh, okay. my captain, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, that whole thing. And it brings home the difference in reality in movies, too, in some ways, which is the real world doesn't always work that way. And, you know, it's beautiful to see and I think aspire to that level of beauty and, you know, understanding and depth. And sometimes it just doesn't hit us that way in real life. That was something, too, that I liked that the movie didn't do. It didn't have, like, a nice, clean, happy ending. True. I mean, obviously, we one of our main characters that we've come to enjoy for the whole movie um, kills himself. And then you have everybody else. Like the movie, pretty much ends on a really depressing note, mm-hmm. you know. And well, I think that's why it's so memorable, is because yeah. one of the first movies to kind of do that. Not one of the first, but it's one of the most profound endings ever. Like, wait, that well, didn't end. In, that didn't end well. Yeah, <laughs> it's entirely unfair too for the teacher who mm-hmm. was being well, blamed. He's a scapegoat for all of it, and none none of the students. You know, they all signed away that you know that was the teacher's fault and then he's getting he got fired and he's walking out so the only real moment that you have of any kind of light or hope is when a few students not even all the students a few students decide to you know basically say that they're standing with him by getting up on their desks which is something that he kind of used as a teaching example earlier. so I, i remember the first time i saw that movie in that moment i mean just welled up um, you know, tears really? and emotion and just like that they would realize the mistake they had made, humble themselves, stand up and just one last time, you know, do you think they made a mistake and... by signing the waiver? Or it's do you think question. that they were given even an option to? I got the impression that they were kind of all basically forced to. That's mm-hmm. what I got. As yeah, well. yeah, yeah. One of the things that, you know, this, this movie is about teenage Didn't boys. one of them not sign the waiver? Nope. They all yeah, he, no, yeah, one of them didn't. He was expelled. Yeah, I thought there was oh, one that made the oh, choice to yeah, be expelled, he and that was the uh, the he was the one that like renamed himself something else, and yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. you know, drew <laughs> drew on his face. Um, I I also this movie is about like is it a preparatory school? Is that what mm-hmm. it's called? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So these are teenage boys. That's right. It's who, not college. No. Yeah. So they're not making their own decisions. They have parents who are very tightly controlling the trajectory of their lives. So it was a really interesting look into and that kind of culture that was very prevalent in the this type of Ivy League sort of preparatory school. You know, you didn't get to make decisions about what you wanted to be when you grew up. Your parents made that decision for you and put you into that kind of Right, and the, and the arts were ridiculous. Yeah. Like, why ever do anything in the arts? And you know? I think that's why I thought this movie was so fascinating is because I actually saw this movie later on in my life, and I came at it from a historical point of view because mm-hmm. America in the 50s is coming off of both world wars, both victorious, so there's the mindset and the mentality among the families that America is the greatest, we know everything, so... The way we're doing stuff now is obviously it's well-structured. We don't need to change anything. 
and that's the way that they implemented in their schools. Don't go away from the criterium. Stick with it. We're going to make the best. And then that went on for many years. And this is the story of how uh, one man said, yes, we're great, but we can be better. Mm -hmm. And that type of thinking back then is, you know, blasphemous almost. I read something really interesting in my little pop-up things as the movie went on sure. that the director made a conscious decision to, because originally the teacher uh, was supposed to die of leukemia. Mm. Huh. Decided, though, to not go with that route because they wanted to focus 100% on the boys. They wanted this to great be decision. about the boys' relationship with each other, their friendships, things like that. Um, and so he did certain things as a director to tie them together. First of all, he made all the the boys live together. Mm-hmm. So they all had to dorm together the entire time. Um, he had them read up on and watch and listen to what was happening in that culture. So the music of that culture, what they would have been doing, their lingo, mm-hmm. things like that. And they also shot the movie in chronological order. Oh, interesting. Which I didn't, growing up, when you're watching, when I was a kid growing up, I always thought that's how they did it. I never yeah. really thought about... Oh, sure. I think most of us have that realization moment at some point where it's like, oh, it's a whole process where right. they, they can shoot the last scene first sometimes. Yeah. And actors have to deal with that. Yes. They don't get to live in those moments the way that we do. But not these actors. It's happened to me a few times whenever I was acting. And... It's weird, I bet. Yeah. Because you just don't know... Like You have to just know your character so well mm-hmm. and be able to compartmentalize. But in this movie, we get to see the progression of these relationships so at the point where they're all, you know, so there's this like group of friends and they're going to the school together and they're all taking, you know, these really intense courses on trigonometry and you, they, the movie does a good job of setting up the intensity of that school structure and, and the rigidity of it. It, it's, mm-hmm. it feels that way. And it's kind of like, it almost made me feel gross in a way. I was like, Oh, I don't, I would, yeah. I would hate that. Um, so by the time that they kind of all are, you know, their great rebellion is going and reading poetry in a cave. So that was, and I'm like, really? This is the big rebellion of the movie? <laughs> and is... trying out for a, a musical. <laughs> trying out for, for a Midsummer Night's Dream. Back then, that was huge. It, yeah. It, it may seem, you know, frivolous and, you know, nothing to us today to go into a cave and read poetry. But back then, try and put yourself in that time period and to think yeah. of what they were doing. It's huge. It is huge. There were a couple of moments, I mean, as their friendships are kind of growing together, where I really love their their character development. Mm-hmm. Um, there's one guy who plays a saxophone instead of reading poetry. And <laughs> and at first he's playing the sax and it's just like this, you know, it doesn't sound very good. And then he starts playing and it just captivates it. And you know what? They do a great job of showing that these friends really cared for each other. They were really close. They all stop when someone's doing something or saying something, I'll stop and pay attention and listen. And I, I I'm like, I crave that. That would be awesome to have a group of friends that, Mm-hmm. You know, we're so invested, like these kids are, I mean, they're the, each other's entire worlds. Yeah. Um, And then there's another moment that I really loved in the character development, uh, which was Ethan Hawke's character, who is, um, like, he, he's just really shy and kind of withdrawn and held mm-hmm. back and kind of stuttery. And at one point in time, Teach brings him up to have him read poetry. And he obviously, he's already written some, we've kind of seen it, but he doesn't bring it to the table because he's embarrassed. So he has him stand up and just like basically come out of him. Mm-hmm. That was mm-hmm. my favorite moment of the movie. That's, yeah, I think that's besides the ending scene. That was that's so one of the best intense. That's I, I have two. I have two yeah. others that I love. One is when he takes them to look at the pictures in the oh at the beginning oh, where, where he's the, like and he hear the whispers of the and I was like oh oh man that's so good yeah and then the other is tearing the chapter out of the book. I there was really? something about that moment where they're just learning who this professor is, and he says, "Okay, now tear that whole chapter out." Yeah. And it's and they're all like, w- "What?" Like yeah. they're awakening to the realization that the rules of the world aren't necessarily the rules you have to live by, and it's just this really interesting combination of respect and rebellion that is. I, I don't know. I, I just find it really fascinating. It's one of the scenes that always stands out for me. Yeah, the way that they on. shot the film that 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 scene with Ethan Hawke and and him starting to speak out loud, the spinning around, the spinning around, yeah. the way that uh, Robin had grasped his face, mm-hmm. you could see his ears turning red. Like you know, he was so in the moment and in character in that embarrassment, he was utterly embarrassed 
to be speaking from his soul in front of his group of peers. Mm -hmm. And then the way that Robin just kind of sits down and just holds his heart and his chest as he watches this kid just start to pour forth this beautiful poetry Mm -hmm. from his soul. I mean, that was like, yep, that's that's the scene that's going to stand out for me. For sure. I mean, the rest of it's really powerful, obviously. Um, when Neil, the character who um, kills himself, I, I was really like frustrated with that. I mean, you could feel the tension kind of mounting. You could feel how it's mm-hmm. like something's about to happen because he gets in trouble for going and doing the play and his dad and mom tell him they're taking him out of that school and they're going to put him into a military school. They're going to make him be a doctor. And there's this moment when they say, well, tell me what you want, which is what Robin told him. Like, you need to tell your family what you want. Mm-hmm. And I know that, I know in my head that we've seen this kid try to tell his dad what he wants several times. It just doesn't work well, but he didn't try. He didn't tell his dad what he wanted. Mm -hmm. Instead, he goes and kills himself. Yeah. You know, and it's just like, Uh, yeah. you know, here's this guy who had the ability to get in front of an audience and nail a play and be really great friends and, you know, he even rallied and encouraged the shy guy to like chuck the desk set. I love that scene off, too. Off of the, the pin set bridge, or whatever. Yeah. Which I love that scene too because of the way that, you know, um, his and Neil and the way that Neil like encourages him is he's like, it doesn't matter. You're going to get another one next year. You know, he really yeah. lightens the mood for this kid who's crushed that mm-hmm. he's getting the same gift over and over again. But anyway, so here's this charismatic guy who just can't talk to his parent. He just can't say what's really on his mind. And he legitimately feels his only option is to take his own life. And what a performance. Robert Sean Leonard is great. I was I was on a Robert Sean Leonard kick at that point in my life. Loved, uh, I don't know if you ever saw Swing Kids. Yeah. So great in Swing Kids. Um, Dead Poet Society. I'm trying to remember what else he was. Oh, Much Ado About Nothing. I don't know if you ever saw... Uh, the Kenneth Branagh version of Much Ado About Nothing. He did a movie with, um, who's the guy from Blacklist? I'm having a brain fart right now. Oh, um, Spader. James Spader. Spader. James, he did a movie with James Spader back in the 90s. It was really good. I thought it was interesting because in Dead Poet Society, uh, Robert Sean Leonard's father is Kurtwood Smith, who's red in that mm-hmm. 70s show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was interesting watching an episode of House where Robert Sean Leonard was Kurtwood Smith's doctor. Oh, that's so funny. <laughs> yeah. I'm well, like, <laughs> and I saw that he joined Ethan Hawke for another movie with Uma Thurman at some point in time too. I mean, these people, they just got in mm-hmm. They're They're doing a great job in this, in this movie. Yeah. But they're the, when the dad, the whole scene of that horrible moment, you know, of him taking his life, which I like how they shot it. Cause you don't see job. anything. Yeah. You don't see any gore. In fact, when you walk in the room, when the dad comes into the room, you don't really even see anything except for some, like he's, he thinks he heard something and yeah. then he smells something. Yeah. That so, moment for the dad too. Oh. And, and the mom. Cause when the mom comes rushing around the corner, she's saying he's okay. He's okay. Which I'm just like, Oh my gosh, this is like a legitimate moment. This is, this is what would be happening, mm-hmm. you know? And that, that really was an, an intense moment. And then of course we go into telling the friends and there's this really, um, incredible scene where all the guys of uh, the friend group go out in the snow. Do you remember the scene? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And they break down. Yeah. So what's powerful about that for, for watching it was, you know, the focus is on Ethan Hawke's character, the one who was shy and quiet because they were roommates and they become friends. And, um, the director originally it was supposed to be shot indoors. And the director said, it's snowing. Let's go outside. And oh, so, interesting. They went out in the snow and they only had one take to get it. And it was like this big deal that they were all able to nail it in this one take. And it's just Ethan, um, Ethan's character crying out, which is what the teacher had asked him to be able to do was to actually express himself. So when he is expressing himself, it's like this full circle. So I think I really did enjoy the movie. There's a lot of just it really informs itself and it kind of goes and folds back in on itself in these really clever ways. Even using language, um, you know, the, the boys kind of picking up on different kinds of poetry and stuff. So I really, I thought it was a good movie, even though it ends tragically. In that way. It, it, interestingly enough, it ends almost depressingly and also inspirationally. It mm-hmm. does both at the same time. 
uh, in my opinion. Uh, a couple of notes for me. Josh Charles, who played uh, Knox <gasps> Overstreet. So good. He was probably the best part of the whole movie. I, I loved I loved him in this uh, and then subsequently fell in love with him again in Sports Night, uh, the Aaron Sorkin TV show. I don't know if you ever saw that one. I always wanted to because it was like a commentary on commentary. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was, yeah, it was commentary mm-hmm. on Sports Center and those kind of things. Yeah, I always wanted to see it. Um, but Josh Charles is one of the main sports anchors in that and he's great in it. And he's still doing good stuff. He's been on uh, a couple other tv shows recently as well um it's a shame his career didn't take off like it should have after dead poet society yeah he was incredible yeah the other thing is this really was robin williams first major dramatic performance he'd done a couple Mm -hmm. other small things i think but this was the first one where people woke up and went oh wait a second this guy can really act yeah uh which is interesting because the director peter weir did the same thing for jim carrey several years later with the Truman, Truman Show. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. So it, it's interesting to see that. And Truman Show is another one that kind of ends mm-hmm. both a little depressingly and also inspirationally with like, you know, having to face the real world and, you know, what's it going to take? I and, never got a depressing feeling from the end of Truman Show. Well, I, maybe it's just maybe it's just open-endedly then. I was just I inspired, you know, because, you know, he hits the wall in the middle of the ocean. Then he ends on his yeah, catchphrase. Yeah, yeah, oh, I love that movie. Oh, the Truman Show. Good afternoon, good evening, and good night. So, uh, so to see Peter Weir do that, you know, uh, with Robin Williams, and then do it again with Jim Carrey, I thought was interesting as well. So, those are a co- couple of the things I talent. wanted to say. He does, and he also and specifically encouraged. Um, I think is the teacher's name is Keating, if I remember. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, Mr. Keating. Um, I can't remember his first name. John. Um, John Keating. But the direct, but the director called him Robin Keating. Because he wanted him to always have the freedom mm. to be a little bit of his own spontaneous self. He didn't mm. want him to get so trapped into the character. So he was encouraging Robin to have that same kind of whimsy. But the crew and everyone were very aware that in real life he was going through a divorce and was actually really depressed during the filming. And Robin so, was. Mm-hmm, and so mm. in between takes and things like that, he was just very quiet and to himself. Whereas, you know, you would be thinking like Mork and Mindy, you know, Popeye guy, you know. Well, it's so incredible to see somebody. I mean, he built his career on insane amounts of manic energy, just crazy comedy. His, you know, his stand up comedy before he was even acting before Mork and Mindy and all that was just a mile a minute. And to see him be able to dial it back like this is is really astonishing. If it he is. watches like seventies stand up or like he's like climbing the rafters and like yeah. I think he's on cocaine. Yeah. I that's that's very likely. <laughs> I mean I don't I don't know that anyone can confirm or deny that, but I just wanted to <laughs> and Well th- and you see some of it loosed again with Aladdin. Like he has that same manic energy with the character of the genie in a lot of ways, which I'm I think glad is he really was able fun. To harness that. Yeah. You Did know, you ever again? watch like the behind the scenes for Aladdin, like how they had to film him and stuff? No. Because he kept moving around so much during like his voiceover. Like they had to work with like this is how I bring life to the character. I can't do it standing still because the genie won't stand still. So they had to follow him around with a microphone or what? I I, I can't remember how they did <laughs> how it, but funny. It, yeah. That's it's pretty. Great, it's pretty uh, fascinating stuff. Uh, let's chat about Patreon. Okay. Let's thank our Patreon supporters. Patreon is uh, a website that exists so that people just like you who enjoy um, what we do can give monthly to support it. Uh, in the studio here, we have monthly fees that come up for not only the equipment but the subscriptions that it takes to create shows like Stiff Pop and like Shoe the Dough. So uh, we want to thank those of you who are already supporting us. And if you would like to consider a dollar a month to help Studio DNA create the shows and Sif Pop Network to do its thing or Shoe the Dough Network to do its thing, we would really appreciate that. You can go to patreon.com slash shoe the dough. And again, a buck a month helps, three bucks a month, five bucks a month. There's different levels uh, with different perks. We already mentioned getting the uh, getting the episode a day early, that kind of stuff. So you can check that out at patreon.com slash shoe the dough. And thank you. We should and always thank say you. thank you because it's amazing. It really is amazing. When you stop and think about the people that support what goes on here. To know that there's fans Souls of the, the show that actually pay every month, even though the podcast is free. Mm-hmm. Um, we really appreciate that you guys do that. So thank you. It goes a long way. It does. That's why I have a cookie right now. <laughs> yes. It's actually you, not true. It's are you true. suggesting we use the Patreon money for cookies? 
No. I okay, don't. good. Uh, I am? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds amazing. <laughs> Why didn't that's we think like of this of the, before? One of the perk levels should be cookies. Cookie. That'll be one of the, <laughs> what do they call the things when uh, when it gets to a certain level and we do something for the studio, like buy equipment? Like or a the, milestone? Milestone. One of the milestones <laughs> should be buy cookies. Yeah. Buy cookies. <laughs> we get to a certain one. Yes, thank you very much for doing that. All right, what's next on the agenda? Well, um, because this is an episode of Danae Finally Sees, I wanted to bring a few other things to the table that I finally saw. Now, should we talk a little bit about the future of Sif Pop and those kind of things as we get into this so we can kind of have a an understanding of dedicating this this episode to you, Danae? Yeah, um, I have decided to take a step back from Sif Pop. Um, is the word indefinitely or is the word... I don't even know what the word indefinitely, is. Indefinitely means that... You're, you don't know when you'll you be back. You don't know when you'll be back. That's yeah. the word. Yeah. That's the word. There's a lot kind of going on in my life. And um, now that we have Andrew here consistently. Hello. And we have other amazing gurus that join us. Um, it's just, you know, I love coming and doing the show. I love what we've been able to do for the last, you know, little while here. But pop culture and movies are not my passion. Right. So um, every once in a while coming in as a guest sounds like a huge bit of fun for me. So I'm really thankful to be able to come back and do shows like this, you know, jumping in as a guru. But as far as, you know, coming in every week, I think it's time to take a little step back. I, what's interesting, too, and I feel like I should say this, you've been off for a few weeks. This was not like a planned th- you know, plan to have you off for a few weeks. And yeah, then there was no weaning plan. No, no, it wasn't. It was, you, know, you had vacation and then sick. and you got sick mm-hmm. and things happened. And so my question to you is, is being away for a couple of weeks led you to this decision where you're like, I could live in this world where I don't have to go in every Friday and, and do the podcast. <laughs> I would come in and do the show because I love doing the show with you guys. Yeah. I really would. Um, but over the past few months, I gave myself permission to say no to going to the movies and that's whenever I was like, oh, yeah, this is what it was like. <laughs> <laughs> when you I know? only went to movies I wanted to see. Which is rarely Which or is ever. <laughs> one a year, maybe. <laughs> Which is why we're doing a Danae Finally Sees Dead right. Poet Society that was released however <laughs> many years ago. Right. So, yeah, I think it's just time to return back to the way that I consume media. And, you know, I'm still going to have a space to come and enjoy with you. So, no, it didn't have anything to do with my time okay, off. Okay, good. That makes me feel it a little better. <laughs> I felt I felt like maybe I made this Finally, happen. <laughs> I got a break from you guys. Um, no, I'm going to I'm gonna genuinely miss it. Um, but I think it's time. Well, we will genuinely miss you as well yeah. on Fridays for sure. Well, absolutely. So, what else do we have for Danae? Yeah, Finally so we're geez. dedicating the rest of this episode to Danae's pop culture experiences. As you know, uh, Sif Pop is recorded with a live internet audience. And I just have to say, Aaron, will you please read the quote <clears throat> that just came in? Spartan Knight says, stands on desk. Oh, Danae, my Danae. Yeah. <laughs> That's so sweet. Thank you. <laughs> yes, actually, Andrew and I signed a thing that it was her fault uh, that something happened, and now she has to yeah. be fired and leave. That's right. <laughs> we it's didn't. My fault. We didn't want to be expelled from Sif Pop. <laughs> <laughs> no, I thought we could put a big bow on a lingering uh, movie that I said I would watch because okay. Andrew brought up a movie. Oh. Yeah, well, I forgot about that one. <laughs> yeah, you did because you had. To All right, be let's like, put some bows on things. What's first? So is Justice League the Flashpoint Paradox? The Flashpoint Paradox. No, I, I haven't it. seen this, so I'm I'm curious to hear your conversation on this. Was it? I think it's on Netflix. It's on Netflix. If okay. I remember correctly, this is uh, a Justice League where things are flipped on their head yeah. in some ways. So yeah, give me the give me the premise again. Oh me? Okay. So it went around the horn there. Aaron <laughs> pointed at Danae, then Danae pointed at me. So so pretty much. Um, it takes, I can't talk too much into it without giving away spoilers, but it takes place in an alternate reality where the origin stories for the characters in the Justice League, like Batman, Superman, The Flash, Aquaman, Martian Manhunter, all their origin stories have been changed and altered to where a butterfly effect sort of thing happens. Like one thing leads to another, and then all of the sudden, everybody the world is totally changed and is not for the better and it's up to uh barry allen the flash to try and put everything back Mm. so barry's the good guy in this one and like uh, some of the other dc characters have turned bad yeah i think the examples that i gave were uh, batman 
was it was Bruce Wayne who was killed in the alley and his parents survived. Oh, wow. And his, his dad, dad becomes this murderous, evil Batman who kills people. And the mom. And the mom becomes the Joker because she be, she goes crazy when her son dies. Wow. Interesting stuff. So, Danae, what did you think? I was confused. <laughs> really? <laughs> the whole time. Because I realized that the only people I knew going in was Batman. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> Like, oh, you super, don't know any of the other DC well, because Superman heroes? looks so different in this. No, I, I mean, I, I guess Superman wasn't it. It was super. Well, here's the thing. You know, Superman gets his power from our. Son. This oh, is yeah, a kind yeah, of yeah. mild okay. spoilers here. Okay. But, yeah. Yeah. yeah there, Superman was in it, but I didn't know because I, I know who the Flash is, but I'm not. Is Wonder familiar. Woman not in it at all? Oh, she is. I'm okay. not familiar with like their characters from a genuine DC perspective. Mm. So I do not recommend watching this. First, I recommend watching something else first that I accidentally came across. I'm going to tell you about. I watched um, Justice League War. War is amazing. It was amazing. And it was super helpful because all of a sudden the Flash or the Flashpoint Paradox started to make sense. In hindsight. (laughs) Because suddenly I knew more about the characters. Like there's this one particular character who is a football player. And then there's this attack from these aliens and he, like, in order to keep him alive because he got hurt, his, you know, science dad uh, puts him into this machine and injects him with, I think, nanobites or something. Yeah. And then he turns into this, like... Midichlorians? Yeah. Sorry. He turns him, it turns he, him into force, a, yeah. some sort of, like, cyborg yeah, guy. cyborg. It's the origin story for Cyborg, mm. who is the creator of the Justice League, pretty much. But in when I watched Flashpoint Paradox, I didn't even know who that guy was. Oh, okay. So I had no idea. Like, I knew things were going on that were not right. Because Flashpoint Paradox is, like, it's gory in a way for cartoons. Oh, yeah. I was going to say animated, right? Yeah, it's animated. So, Hand-drawn? And it's disturbing because you're watching your beloved characters... Kill each other. Kill each other, kill other people. And it's just like... So I did love it, but I was confused. But not in a way where I was, like, frustrated, confused. Yeah. So, like, the main focus of this is Aquaman and Wonder Woman have an affair, and it ends up being that Wonder Woman kills Aquaman's wife, and that leads to a war between Atlantis and Amazons. Wow. And they they destroy destroy Europe. They, They destroy all of Europe in this war. And then it's, you know, all the superheroes that we know and love trying to stop them. Wow. It was crazy. And And Flash has to, um, when he, so he, first it starts off in like a real world and then it shifts over into this paradox world because there's a bad Flash and a good Flash. And so bad. Reverse Flash if you watch the Flash show. Oh yeah, yeah. Reverse Flash. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, and and somehow they, he's created this alternate, oh no, he, he created this, there's this timeline where the Flash did something and it affected the rest of... Yeah, Flash is like that, though. Flash is full of alternate worlds, alternate yeah. timelines. That's that's one of the big things with but the character. I, I, yeah. I did really enjoy it because I love, I love animated movies and I love... These characters were fun. I thought they did a great job. It was really entertaining. Is that why it's called Flashpoint Paradox? Because it's the Flash? Mm-hmm. Ah! I'll see, look at my brain putting stuff together. Yeah. But I would recommend watching uh, Justice League War first if you don't know the characters as okay. well as I did, because Good that point. they had a, that was a really great one too. It's sort of the uh, origin story for the Justice League, which was super helpful for someone who's never done any looking good. into to that so, oh, yeah, very if you, good because if you read the new 52 comics for the justice league it's like the first couple issues i put, put in comic or cartoon form. didn't realize like green lantern is hilarious oh and flash is hilarious yeah and green lantern's banter with batman in justice league war hilarious like this when they're is in just, the sewers oh it's just fun stuff yeah, yeah. oh it's a lot of fun cool so i, I really enjoyed out. those what else do we need a closure on danae from your pop culture world well i finished watching with my husband stranger things yeah tell us about Ooh. your uh, final thoughts on stranger things oh my goodness i almost bought an 85 dollar stranger things dress <laughs> Is it the one that Eleven wore? That's so funny. <laughs> no, but uh, I wish hilarious. it would have been. Uh, I wanted to get mem. Like I wanted to just like live it again. Be in Stranger Things. There was absolutely nothing I didn't love about it. 
I yeah. loved every single episode. I loved wow. every single part. And, you know... You loved the ending? I loved the ending. I, lo- I loved it all. And there was this... Uh, like, as I'm looking through, and I'm trying to find screensavers for mm-hmm. my phone of Stranger Things. In fact, I've got one right now. I think, Andrew, you'll really like it. Oh, that's so good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So as I'm like looking around for all this, you know, stuff... It's like you'll see scenes or you'll see a clip from the show. And you just remember how awesome you and thought you it remember, was. Yeah. yeah. And every single clip is just a reminder of how well they made the series. So I was talking to your hubby the other day Il hubby. on the Facebook and I was telling him that they're going to start making season two pretty soon. Yes. Which Justin was very verbal about, about not, not wanting, wanting a sequel. Yeah. A sequel. Really? Yeah. I'm kind of with him. I'm kind of there. I, I if it's understand. an anthology, maybe. If it's a, you know, but the thing is, I know a lot of people want to see those kids again, and I'm just like, ah, oh, you, you don't can't. need, you just, you don't need to They're go back. They're not kids anymore. <laughs> yeah, you, you just let them live well, in that story and and just love it for what it was, and then tell another great story, I guess, from the same universe, maybe. But I don't know. I don't know. What do you think, Andrew? I want to see the kids again. <laughs> they're they're so good. I. I it's I get why people like no their story was great don't ruin it but I think those kids are good enough actors to where if they came back for a second season they would nail it again because their chemistry was so yeah good. there's just so much weight for when something has exploded out of nowhere like this the follow up there's so much pressure yeah and you just wonder if the if there's just such a human tendency to take a look at something that follows something you love and be like eh one's not as good as the first one you know. And it's just, I don't know. I, I don't know. I, and I don't feel I the agree. need for it. I don't feel the need for another you know, story with them. It stands alone. I mean, the finale, which um, I don't I don't think we're going to spoil. No. Because people still haven't seen it, and it's worth going and watching. Um, but the finale, you know, of course, it leaves some, it leaves enough. Oh, it's very open in uh, Of bunny trails and breadcrumb trails that would allude to a second season. So now that it's, like, confirmed that it's moving forward... I'm just hoping that they think it through in the same way that they thought through the first season. Because mm-hmm. every episode had this wonderful weaving where every single character that you see, you develop an understanding of like their progression. You feel like they're you can understand their story. You're going through something with them, which is hard to do when there's this huge cast. Now, I think it's in sections because of how you know it's on individual episodes but if you binge watch it it's just like a really long movie they do such a great job of weaving it all together i i love that you say that because i totally agree and this thought isn't original to me i heard it on another podcast and i think it's such a beautiful explanation for why this show works so well it follows all three age groups perfectly yeah. it follows the kids perfectly it follows the teenagers perfectly and it follows the adults perfectly and not, only and that, not many pop culture things are able to do that they always have one perspective or usually have one perspective and they don't do the toss away character development that right. you kind of come to expect well, there, there like, are a couple there are a couple toss away characters are a couple but the they do a good job of surprising you that you think a character is going to you know arc this way and they surprise you and they mature, they change. So, yeah, you're perfectly following these age groups, but then they're also doing a good job of developing these individuals inside of that. In the chat, uh, they say there's a 30 page thesis that explains the world that the writers have created. So they've got plenty of ideas. That gives me a little more confidence that they're not just, oh, no, you know, got to make something else. Like if they've got a world in mind that they really want to explore. I like that because then they're passionate about it. And, you know, I know they'll bring that same kind of energy to it. So. I'm glad that they were able to find a studio to produce this. I know that they kind of pitched it to several and they were rejected. The brother, brothers, what was it? Daniel or no? Um, the Duplass brothers. Or not the Duplass. It was the, the, it started with a D. The Doobie brothers. Yeah. Is it Daniel? No, Daniel brothers did um, Swiss Army Man. Yeah. Um, come on. Po- come on, Pop. Because I, I thought it was funny. It was the Daniel brothers that wrote and directed it. Daniel Radcliffe Duffer, started Duffer it. Duffer brothers. Duffer and uh, brothers. Paul Dano was the co-star and I thought that was interesting. Lots of dance. They did a lot of things really, really good when they made this. Um, it's got the perfect amount of creep factor. And I have to tell you, it is a super satisfying creature. We get to actually see a creature fight, mm-hmm. you know, and in a lot of this, like, I don't know, some of the movies where you got this little creep factor, you don't really get a good 
creature well, it's, fight. Well, it's just such a fully realized world, and I think that's so important I for a th- sci-fi movie to do. Through the movie, you're kind of like getting glimpses. I love that we keep calling it a movie. Continue. Yeah, sorry. No, no, through no. Show, I, I love it. You're getting these like glimpses. You're getting these like you know kind of nods to what this demi gorgon could be. The upside down. But then at towards the end whenever you know everything's kind of coming together and you've got these big fights that are just you know they're impending it's happening there are some crazy fun fight scenes and man it's so good i loved it i freaking loved it you gonna watch it again yeah for sure oh yeah yeah uh something else you finished on netflix that we should bring some closure to that you wanted to talk about jessica jones jessica jones how did you feel about that did you finish that one andrew i'm surprised you finished that one i am too considering how dark it is (laughs) it is very dark it is dark um i mean it was like i just kept being surprised at how i I really just wanted closure I like wanted you don't really, closure. I mean, you mind going into detail about that? Like, you want a closure on what? I wanted closure to make sure the creepo guy like got taken care <laughs> oh, of. Oh, the purple man, um, David Tennant. David Tennant. You know, I yeah. can't. I can't see him as anything but Doctor Who. So. I can now. He was so was he great Doctor in that. Who? Oh yeah, he's the most he's, famous Doctor. Oh, Who. he's the best Doctor Who ever. Yeah, oh. Tennant was the best. I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. I never, I've never seen Doctor Who. So yeah. now whenever I watch Doctor Who someday, right? Someday. <laughs> someday. In 2030 he's when the, I watch Doctor he's Who. He's the best Doctor Who. Easily the best Doctor Who. Uh, some people would argue with you, but not me. I, I, I'm I a tenant guy through and through. All yeah. I'm going to see is that guy. The purple man. <laughs> what What was his name, though? What was the bad guy's name? Uh, and Jessica Gra- Jones? Grave? Uh, yeah, Kilgrave. 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 Yeah, yeah. That's all I'm going to see. Yeah, there was... There was a couple episodes that I, I was like, I need to just try to make it through the third, you know, because that's your rule, Aaron. So I was like, I'm going to try. Yeah. So I made it through the third episode. And Three was, episode test, I call it. And there was a there was a few there was a few parts of the story that really kept me curious enough to go another one, and then th- that just that that did me in. I kind of had to. I was surprised that um, I came to understand uh, Kilgrave's character. They. You know, in this particular series, with his backstory, yeah, yeah, it's you know, it's not like a episode where okay, you're taking care of this bad guy because you know, in Batman series growing up, it was like okay, the, the, Joker. the old Adam West, sort yeah, of, yeah, yeah, and then but here in Jessica Jones or and how they, it's the whole series. You've got this nemesis. And well, what's interesting though is he's not really in the beginning of the series. Kilgrave is barely there to like episode five. He's yeah. alluded to. He's alluded to, but you really don't get to... And I loved that. I loved that they let him linger as some sort of almost presence until, you know, later on in the series. I thought that was cool. By the end of the series, I was very impressed. I mean, it is a very gory and dark because Kilgrave himself it has no emotion towards taking human lives. Oh, he's, yeah, he's a sociopath completely. And, yeah. and but it is pl- it his fault? And it plays on... It plays on the... Um, the heart of Jessica because she makes a lot of decisions trying to save people because she knows what he's doing. And, and it also plays in that thing where the, something so crazy is happening. Does anyone believe her? And she has just enough people in her life that believe her that you're like, okay, good. She's okay. Someone believes her, but then like, how are, how is this all going to come together? So I was, um, you know, I was in it to try to figure it out and then if it sets it up for, you know, whatever might be coming next. Is there going to be another? Yeah, there's going to be. Oh, a- well, there's several. Mar- uh, Marvel is doing a whole series. So like the guy, Luke Cage, who's in Jessica Jones. Which one's that? The, the guy that the has impenetrable guy can't, skin. Can't, you can't. Can't hurt his skin. Oh, can't hurt yeah, him. Yeah, yeah. He, he has, has a whole show. series that will be coming out on Luke Cage. And then uh, this year, they already did Daredevil. Daredevil's in that same universe in Hell's Kitchen. Um, and so. Oh, I have a question. So, uh, in one of, in, well, towards the end, when, you know, there's a lot more destruction happening, um, Jessica Jones finds herself at a hospital. Yep. Yeah, that's doctors her. from the Daredevil series. Yeah. Oh, and so when she said, I've got a friend that could yep. help you. Daredevil. Yep. Okay, I was so confused. Yeah. So, what they're going to do today is there's going to be a show coming out on Netflix called The Defenders. And it's like the Avengers, except it's all the people from the Netflix. From Hell's Kitchen. From yeah. Hell's Kitchen, like Jessica Jones, Daredevil, Punisher, and they're going to not take on like the big stuff that uh, the Avengers do. They're going to take on the big stuff for Hell's Kitchen. 
Got it. So kind of like more local. Yeah, localized. Crime and yeah. Stuff. yeah. Like a localized Avengers. And then yeah. Iron Fist will be there as well, which he has his show coming out next year, too. It'll I also good. thought that the movie or the series did a good job. <laughs> uh, it feels like a movie. They did a good job of um, giving breath to um, like their real lives. You really get a feel that she's just a, as normal of a person as you can. Uh, there's this one particular episode where um, she has been hired by someone to do some investigation into a potential cheating husband, but really it's a setup because they want to try to take her out because mm-hmm. she's a, a gifted person, yeah, I think right. is what they're calling them. And I like that they got to spend an episode doing something that didn't have anything to do with Kilgrave, really. It didn't have anything to do with like, right. her normal. And they weave stuff in there, but they just take a pause and so I, I think that they're doing a good job with the creating creating those series to sort of make it, you know, interesting. They're- I thought, yeah, I thought Jessica Jones was great. I really did. We all have a oh, mutual oh. friend named Brian, and he's also on the Flick Freaks podcast that I do. He loathes superheroes. Mm-hmm. He doesn't like superhero movies, TV shows, anything. He says that Jessica Jones is one of the best shows he's ever seen because it's the most human superhero yeah. show he has ever seen in his life. Oh, that's cool. I agree with that. And for that reason, I was also, I think I was getting more drawn in because you just, she didn't really mean to have anything happen, which brings me to my next question for, that we might, you guys might know the answer to. Okay. The um, company that kind of comes out in the last mm-hmm. yeah. three episodes or so um, alluded to for, uh, like how she got her powers. Yep. Do you know about that? Is that going to come out like Roughly, in the series? Or? Rough, uh, Jessica Jones. Something interesting that Marvel has decided to do with their Netflix series is like, yeah, we have all these super famous characters like Captain America and Thor, and we're putting those in big, big blockbusters. We're going to take our third grade, like or third level C characters nobody knows about, and we're going to put them on Netflix because they do have interesting backstories, just nobody knows about them. And now people are starting to know about them, but for me, I don't know that much about Jessica Jones. So there's a there's like a corporation that maybe makes meds and is making these killer because there's a character that starts popping pills and yeah he he's a he's a, a huge super... nemesis in um, Marvel. Oh, so that's his origin story. It's so crazy so how it's, I mean, you just think of all the comic books that have come out in the last, you know, 60, 70 years and or beyond and how they're now, you know, weaving them all together. It's just so brilliant. See, and, that's going to be fun if something else pops in and I'm like, I know who that is because I saw him. <laughs> so I think I think at the end of the day, I would say I'm glad that I pushed through on Jessica Jones. I would definitely remind people that it is very serious. <laughs> Uh, you see people do horrible, horrible things to I each other. I can't think of a single funny thing in that entire show. I don't think I laughed or kind of chuckled. Oh, I think there's or... some humor there. It's very dark humor, but I especially Kilgrave. Kilgrave says some things that are pretty funny. Yeah. Uh, in a dark way. I don't know. I don't remember. I don't remember it going <laughs> that way at all. Maybe. All right. Maybe that was just me. Maybe I'm a sick it's, man. It's fascinating because when he is at one point captured and captivated and being filmed, they're trying to like... Oh, you know, yeah. prove that he is able to do mind control. I mean, that stuff was fascinating because it's just such an intricate world. And mm-hmm. we, the viewer, are the ones who have all the answers and we're hoping everyone can figure it out that's in that world. So I I was I was in enough to where I binge watched way too early and I should have gone to bed. <laughs> And I couldn't finish the series. I was like, I can't. I've got to stop. That should be that should be Netflix tagline. You should have gone to bed. <laughs> I should. We all to know bed, you should have gone to bed. But I didn't. So I don't know. I think that um, it's on the level, like gore wise or dark wise, of kind of like a CSI type show. Oh, I think it's way. Uh, yeah, worse I think it's darker than and gorier than way. that. I don't know. Yeah, I, I think it's more intense because CSI you're could part never of get certain... away with some of that stuff that they did in there. <laughs> no. Never. Really? Really? Oh yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't know Network if I agree TV. with that. No, with no, that. no. Network TV could have never handled this, the gore and darkness. And have you seen Jessica that Jones. show? I CSI? Mean, they show, they yeah. show dead bodies and gross stuff all the time. Sure, sure. But not like not like that. It's the it's not really the gore and stuff. Because, yeah, the gore and stuff in Jessica Jones really isn't all that bad. But the stuff they're talking about. The psychological the part psychological of it is. The psychological stuff in Jessica I Jones. I think that's is, on Network TV. I, I think mean, it's way worse. I mean, way, I want way more mature, I should say. I it's don't it's know if I certainly agree. Conver- a conversation we could continue to have, and I don't mind agreeing to disagree, but yeah, I don't, I don't 
CBS could have never gotten away. Jessica Jones as is could never have aired on CBS. What's the show where they, where they, it's specifically towards like criminal minds. Mm -hmm. When that show came out, I had to stop watching it because I was like, this is too on the nose. These series, they're, this is psychological creepo factor. Mm -hmm. I think that stuff is on network TV. Absolutely. Personally. I think it's a little watered down. We'll end it. With a disagreement. Yeah. Uh, Before we get to our buried treasure, of course. One thing in the world of pop culture we'll do quickly, because I know we're pushing time uh, that you want to make sure people know about. Today, you want to kick us off? I have nothing. Oh, there you go. That saves time. Okay. Andrew? I have a comic book for my Dewey, or uh, hmm? buried treasure. Applicable. We've been talking a lot about comics. I know. And you know what? I don't think we've ever done a comic book for a... Uh, Buried Treasure. I don't know that anybody has. I know you've done online comics for Buried Treasure before <gasps> web comics. I should bring mine back. I'll follow up. <laughs> I'll follow up with you. Okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So this newest comic that I'm going to tell you about has is created by two very famous people. One of them is Max Brooks. Okay. We were talking about Mel Brooks earlier. Yep. It's his son yep. who is the creator of World War Z. Mm-hmm. And the other creator is Alan Moore. Okay. Who for if as soon as I said that people who know comic books know Alan Moore, he's made some of the most famous yeah, the comic name is books very familiar. of all. He made Watchmen. He made, right. he made Batman the Killing Joke, and he's the creator of V for Vendetta comic book series. Okay, he's got a new one. Yeah, oh, he, he has a new, new one? one that he's creating with Max Brooks right now. It's called A More Perfect Union. It's sci-fi, alternate universe takes place back in the 1800s during the Civil War. Starts off, you see Gettysburg. That's where the whole thing takes place. Pans in on Robert or General Robert E. Lee, the greatest uh, military mind of that time. Even um, that That's not a uh, Southern thing. Like, yeah, he, he was historically the greatest. Uh, He's a mastermind. Of yeah, mastermind. He just, he just ended up losing. But... um. So you see him looking over this uh, battle plan in his tent, and all of a sudden, his general, Ulysses S. Grant, comes in. And you're like, wait, what a minute? They're on the same side? What's going on? Uh-huh. Then you go outside, and you see that there are white soldiers, there are black soldiers, there are women soldiers. You're like, what is going on? This is definitely weird. Turns out, and this is where the sci-fi, sci-fi element comes in. This race of giant bugs has invaded from Starship Troopers, Starship Trooper style, but it doesn't take place in the future. It takes place when during the our, Civil War times, our technology is at its, you know, at its weakest infancy. Yeah. So what Gettysburg is in this alternate reality is it's the last bastion of hope where if Robert E. Lee can hold off these alien or these insects while technology catches up to what it needs because you know a few years after civil war we got planes Mm -hmm. we got machine guns we got so pretty much gettysburg is them trying to hold off and it's really a interesting social statement on the fact that the reason why it's called a more perfect union is it's the unification of mankind against a common goal yeah and which really is the overall theme of the independence day movies as well exactly yeah. yeah how we set aside our differences for the greater good of our own species. And if you look at, because uh, Max Brooks was talking about how, if you look at old comic books or even old TV shows like uh, Next Generation, yes, they were sci-fi themed, but they all had social statements that were relevant to the times of when they were being watched. Like if you watch an episode of Star Trek, there's a good possibility there's a social statement about race, gender equality, sexual equality and it's very prevalent and that's something that max brooks and alan moore are trying to bring forward in this new comic book series sounds awesome i've only read there's five uh comic books out i've only read the first one it's amazing it's good so quality good. too oh yeah okay cool what's it called again a more perfect a more union. perfect union danae did you want to take a shot at uh, update on your web comics i just wanted to remind everybody if you love comics there are wait a let couple, me guess let me guess gunner Craig court there are a couple right now that are super good and gunner Craig court is blowing my mind yeah you keep talking about that all the time please go read it from the beginning it is so fun and so good it's a little sci-fi a little you know i think i would be more considered sci-fi um, Gunner Craig G U N N E R K R I G G dot com is by Tom Siddell. 
the point, like what's going on right now is I'm just, I'm like on the edge of my seat and it updates every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Yeah. So every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and I've seriously followed this now for, oh my goodness, seven years. I've been reading this comic, maybe? I believe it was Tuesday of this week you came into work and went, why does it have to be Tuesday? Seriously. (laughs) I want a new Gunner Creek core. I have been reading this comic for a very long time, and it is so good. And another one that I would recommend that just had its 10th birthday is Faye Wins, F-E-Y-W-I-N-D-S. Her art is incredible, and I love the story. I'm really curious where she's going to take it. Cool. Um, and she just started kind of releasing them again because she had to have surgery, which for an artist is never good if it's on your wrist because you have to recover. Yeah, for sure. And, uh, so please go check those out because they're amazing. My uh, Buried Treasure is a movie that I guess I could say I'm late to the party on, although it's a more smaller film, so a lot of people are late to the party on. Mm-hmm. Um, Andrew, I believe you've seen it because I think I've heard you talk about it before, but Sing Street. Uh, Sing Street is really really good if you get a chance to see it it's about um a kid in ireland in ireland uh who forms a band to get a girl basically and uh, really simple story but it's yeah. really well executed oh it's beautiful and here's my thing about it it's a perfect musical yeah in that the music in it feels so essential to the story and to what's going on that you don't you almost don't realize it's a musical yeah, but it is with brand new music and in in fact, I've listened to the soundtrack over and over again since I saw it, and it's it's beautiful and heartfelt. And we had a guru on a couple of weeks ago, Devon Taylor. Mm-hmm. He's the one who introduced me to it so. to Sing Street. Yeah, yeah. So check out Sing Street. I'd highly recommend it. I think it's out uh, just recently or here to come soon on Blu-ray and, and DVD. So yeah, check it out. I know it's available digitally right now. So there you go. Well, Danae. Aaron. Round of applause for Danae. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We I like the Danae themed episode. You. As soon as you're ready to come back, you just let us know and we'll have another Danae themed episode and, you know, let you okay. pick stuff. Should we we'll do think, that? Should we think of something for Danae to choose to see? Or, <laughs> <laughs> and then she can be back on in a couple months. <laughs> have you ever seen Firefly? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, we could do we could do like a Sif Pop Rewind. You know, yeah. if she comes back on and maybe have her, you know, see something she never got around to that she wants to see or, you know, maybe have the audience, uh, you know, figure well, out I will something. tell you, I didn't want to see Dead Poet Society. I right. wasn't excited about it. I right. watched it just because I knew that we were going to cover it today. And well, I'm glad that we did. Did you know the audience voted on it last time we were going to do a, uh, a rewind? I that was the movie that, that won. And yeah. so that's where it started. Maybe that's what we should do. Maybe we should just put together another... What, a poll? What, what should and then seven months rewind. later? <laughs> yeah. And then seven months later, you can come on and do exactly. it? Movies don't <laughs> expire. You can go and see them whenever. Now, I will tell you, just as a reminder, we're not going to... I'm not going to be pulling back from Shoe the Dough, so you can still check yes. that show out. Uh, we go live every Tuesday a mixler for shoe the dough and that's released in the podcast feed on wednesday so i will still be co-hosting that show with mr aaron dice yeah absolutely week. you can get your danae phil on podcast on tuesdays um she just doesn't want to hang out with programming me. note Aww. programming note uh we are off next week both shoe the dough and sif pop will be off next week okay. uh, we're as be we're in traveling Florida. Um, so, uh, just a heads up on that. When we come back, I'm sure we'll be talking movies. I also kind of want to do a, uh, most anticipated films for the rest of the year. So we'll probably talk about stuff we're looking forward to coming up by the end of the year. So excited about that. Thanks so much for joining us today for Sif Pop. It's part of the Shoe the Dough podcast network. You can find out more about other live and later shows on the network by following the feed at Mixler.com slash Shoe the Dough. That's M-I-X-L-R.com slash Shoe the Dough. Huge thanks to today's guru, Danae Hughes. The best guru ever. Oh, you guys. Do you have anything you want to plug, Danae? Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Danae Says or Instagram. Find me, J. Danae. And of course, much love and gratitude to our Patreon supporters for giving monthly to make this show and others on the network possible. Support starts at a dollar a month and comes with some pretty fun perks. You can find out more info at patreon.com slash shoe the dough. Please subscribe, rate, and comment in iTunes. That really helps us out quite a bit. And if you have any feedback for us, you can email us directly at shoe the dough at gmail.com. <laughs>